Letter Ten, Part One of A Lady's Life in the Rocky Mountains. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Lady's Life in the Rocky Mountains by Isabella L. Bird, Part One of Letter Ten. Colorado Springs, October twenty eighth. It is difficult to make this anything of a letter. I have been writing for a whole week, seeing wonders and greatly enjoying the singular adventurousness of novelty of my tour. But ten hours or more daily spent in the saddle in this rarefied, intoxicating air disposes one to sleep rather than to write in the evening, and is far from conducive to mental brilliancy. The observing faculties are developed, and the reflective lie dormant. That night on which I last wrote was the coldest I have yet felt. I pulled the rag carpet from the floor and covered myself with it, but could not get warm. The sun rose gloriously on a shrouded earth. Barns, road, shrubs, fences, river, lake, all lay under the glittering snow. It was light and powdery, and sparkled like diamonds. Not a breath of wind stirred. There was not a sound. I had to wait till a passing horseman had broken the track, but soon after I set off into the new, shining world. I soon lost the horseman's footmarks, but kept on near the road, by means of the innumerable footprints of birds and ground squirrels, which all went in one direction. After riding for an hour, I was obliged to get off and walk for another. For the snow, bald in Bertie's feet, to such an extent that she could hardly keep up, even without my weight on her, and my pick was not strong enough to remove it. Turning off the road to ask for a chisel, I came upon the cabin of the people whose muff I had picked up a few days before, and they received me very warmly, gave me a tumbler of cream, and made some strong coffee. They were old country folk, and I stayed too long with them. After leaving them, I rode twelve miles, but it was bad travelling, from the bawling of the snow and the difficulty of finding the track. There was a fearful loneliness about it. The track was untrodden, and I saw neither man nor beast. The sky became densely clouded, and the outlook was awful. The great divide of the Arkansas was in front, looming vaguely through a heavy snow-cloud, and snow began to fall not in powder, but in heavy flakes. Finding that there would be risk in trying to ride till nightfall, in the early afternoon I left the road, and went two miles into the hills, by an untrodden path, where there were gates to open, and a rapid steep-sided creek to cross, and at the entrance to a most fantastic gorge I came upon an elegant frame house, belonging to Mr. Perry, a millionaire, to whom I had an introduction, which I did not hesitate to present, as it was weather, in which a traveller might almost ask for shelter without one. Mr. Perry was away, but his daughter, a very bright-looking, elegantly dressed girl, invited me to dine and remain. They had stewed venison and various luxuries on the table, which was tasteful and refined, and an adroit coloured table-maid waited. One of five attached negro servants, who had been their slaves before the war. After dinner, though snow was slowly falling, a gentleman cousin took me a ride to show me the beauties of Pleasant Park, which takes rank among the finest scenery of Colorado, and in good weather is very easy of access. It did look very grand, as we entered it by a narrow pass, guarded by two buttes, or isolated upright masses of rock, bright red, and about three hundred feet in height. The pines were very large, and the narrow canyons which came down on the park gloomily magnificent. It is remarkable also from a quantity of monumental rocks, from fifty to three hundred feet in height, bright vermilion, green, buff, orange, and sometimes all combined, their gay tinting a contrast to the disastrous-looking snow and the somber pines. Bear Canyon, a gorge of singular majesty, comes down on the park, and we cross the Bear Creek at the foot of this on the ice, which gave way, 
and both our horses broke through into pretty deep and very cold water. And shortly afterwards, Bertie put her foot into a prairie dog's hole, which was concealed by the snow, and on recovering herself, fell three times on her nose. I thought of Bishop Wilberforce's fatal accident from a smaller stumble, and felt sure that he would have kept his seat had he been mounted, as I was, on a Mexican saddle. It was too threatening for a long ride, and on returning I passed into a region of vivacious descriptions, of Egypt, Palestine, Asia Minor, Turkey, Russia, and other countries, in which Miss Perry had travelled with her family for three years. Perry's Park is one of the great cattle-raising ranches in Colorado. This, the youngest state in the Union, a territory until quite recently, has an area of about sixty-eight million acres, a great portion of which, though rich in mineral wealth, is worthless, either for stock or arable farming. And the other, or eastern part, is so dry that crops can only be grown profitably where irrigation is possible. This region is watered by the south fork of the Platte and its affluents, and though, subject to the grasshopper pest, it produces wheat of the finest quality, the yield varying according to the mode of cultivation, from eighteen to thirty bushels per acre. The necessity of irrigation, however, will always bar the way to an indefinite extension of the area of arable farms. The prospects of cattle-raising— seem at present practically unlimited. In 1876, Colorado had 390,728, valued at two pound thirteen shillings per head, about half of which were imported as young beasts from Texas. The climate is so fine, and the pasturage so ample, that shelter and hand-feeding are never resorted to except in the case of imported breeding stock from the eastern states which sometimes, in severe winters, need to be fed in sheds for a short time. Mr. Perry devotes himself mainly to the breeding of graded shorthorn bulls, which he sells when young, for six pounds per head. The cattle run at large upon the prairies, each animal being branded. They need no herding, and are usually only mustered, counted, and the increase branded in the summer. In the fall, when three or four years old, they are sold lean, or in tolerable condition to dealers, who take them by rail to Chicago, or elsewhere, where the fattest lots are slaughtered for tinning, or for consumption in the eastern cities, while the leaner are sold to farmers for feeding up during the winter. Some of the wealthier stockmen take their best lots to Chicago themselves. The Colorado cattle are either pure Texan or Spanish, or crosses between the Texan and graded shorthorns. They are nearly all very inferior animals, being bony and ragged. The herds mix on the vast plains at will. Along the Arkansas Valley, eighty thousand roam about with the freedom of buffaloes, and of this number about sixteen thousand are exported every fall. Where cattle are killed for use in the mining districts, their average price is three cents per pound. In the summer, thousands of yearlings are driven up from Texas, branded, and turned loose on the prairies, and are not molested again till they are sent east at three or four years old. These pure Texans, the old Spanish breed, weigh from nine hundred to one thousand pounds, and the crossed Colorado cattle from one thousand to twelve hundred pounds. The cattle king of the state is Mr. Eliff, of South Platte, who owns nine ranches, with runs of fifteen thousand acres, and thirty-five thousand cattle. He is improving his stock, and, indeed, the opening of the dead-meat trade with this country is giving a great impetus to the government of the breed of cattle, among all the larger and richer stock-owners. For this enormous herd, forty men are employed in summer, about twelve in winter, and two hundred horses. In the rare case of a severe and protracted snowstorm, the cattle get a little hay. Owners of six thousand, eight thousand, and ten thousand head of cattle are quite common in Colorado. Sheep are now raised in the state to the extent of half a million, and a chronic feud prevails between the sheepmen and the cattlemen. Sheep raising is said to be a very profitable business, but its risks and losses are greater, owing to storms 
while the outlay for labor, dipping materials, and so forth, is considerably larger. And owing to the comparative inability of sheep to scratch away the snow from the grass, hay has to be provided to meet the emergency of very severe snowstorms. The flocks are made up mostly of pure and graded Mexicans, but though some flocks which have been graded carefully for some years show considerable merit, the average sheep is a leggy, ragged beast. Weather mutton, four and five years old, is sold when there is any demand for it, but except at Sharpio's in Denver I never saw mutton on any table, public or private, and wool is the great source of profit, the old ewes being allowed to die off. The best flocks yield an average of seven pounds. The shearing season, which begins in early June, lasts about six weeks. Shearers get six and a half cents a head for inferior sheep, and seven and a half cents for the better quality, and a good hand shears from sixty to eighty in a day. It is not likely that sheep raising will attain anything of the prominence which cattle raising is likely to assume. The potato beetle scare is not of much account in the country of potato beetle. The farmers seem much depressed about the magnitude and persistency of the grasshopper pest, which finds their fields in the morning as the Garden of Eden, and leaves them at night a desolate wilderness. It was so odd and novel to have a beautiful bedroom, hot water, and other luxuries. The snow began to fall in good earnest at six in the evening, and fell all night, accompanied by intense frost, so that in the morning there were eight inches of it glittering in the sun. Miss P. gave me a pair of men's socks to draw on over my boots, and I set out tolerably early, and broke my own way for two miles. Then a single wagon had passed, making a legible track for thirty miles. Otherwise the snow was pathless. The sky was absolutely cloudless, and as I made the long ascent of the Arkansas Divide, the mountains, gashed by deep canyons, came sweeping down to the valley on my right, and on my left the foothills were crowned with colored, fantastic rocks like castles. Everything was buried under a glittering shroud of snow. The babble of the streams was bound by fetters of ice. No branches creaked in the still air. No birds sang. No one passed or met me. There were no cabins near or far. The only sound was the crunch of the snow under Bertie's feet. We came to a river over which some logs were laid with some young trees across them. Bertie put one foot on this, then drew it back, and put another on, then smelt the bridge noisily. Persuasions were useless. She only smelt, snorted, held back, and turned her cunning head and looked at me. It was useless to argue the point with so sagacious a beast. To the right of the bridge the ice was much broken, and we forded the river there. But as it was deep enough to come up to her body, and was icy cold to my feet, I wondered at her preference. Afterwards I heard that the bridge was dangerous. She is the queen of ponies, and is very gentle, though she has not only wild horse blood, but is herself the wild horse. She is always cheerful and hungry, never tired, looks intelligently at everything, and her legs are like rocks. Her one trick is that when the saddle is put on, she swells herself to a very large size, so that if any one not accustomed to her saddles her, I soon find the girth three or four inches too large. When I saddle her, a gentle slap on her side, or any slight part which makes her cease to hold her breath, puts it all right. She is quite a companion, and bathing her back, sponging her nostrils, and seeing her fed after my day's ride is always my first care. At last I reached a log cabin, where I got a feed for us both, and further directions. The rest of the day's ride was awful enough. The snow was thirteen inches deep, and grew deeper as I ascended in silence and loneliness. But just as the sun sank behind a snowy peak, I reached the top of the divide, 7,975 feet above the sea level. There, in unspeakable solitude, lay a frozen lake. Owls hooted among the pines, 
The trail was obscure. The country was not settled. The mercury was nine degrees below zero. My feet had lost all sensation, and one of them was frozen to the wooden stirrup. I found that owing to the depth of the snow I had only ridden fifteen miles in eight and a half hours, and must look about for a place to sleep in. The eastern sky was unlike anything I ever saw before. It had been chrysopace when it turned to aquamarine, and that to the bright full green of an emerald. Unless I am color-blind, this is true. Then suddenly the whole changed, and flushed with the pure, bright, rose color of the afterglow. Bertie was sliding at every step, and I was nearly paralyzed with the cold when I reached a cabin which had been mentioned to me. But they said that seventeen snowbound men were lying on the floor, and they advised me to ride half a mile farther, which I did, and reached the house of a German from Eisenau, with a sweet young wife and a venerable mother-in-law. Though the house was very poor, it was made attractive by ornaments, and the simple, loving, German ways gave it a sweet home atmosphere. My room was reached by a ladder, but I had it to myself, and had the luxury of a basin to wash in. Under the kindly treatment of the two women, my feet came to themselves, but with an amount of pain that almost deserved the name of torture. The next morning was gray and sour but brightened and warmed as the day went on. After riding twelve miles, I got bread and milk for myself, and a feed for Bertie, at a large house where there were eight boarders, each one looking nearer the grave than the other, and on remounting, was directed to leave the main road and diverge through Monument Park, a ride of twelve miles among fantastic rocks. But I lost my way, and came to an end of all tracks in a wild canyon. Returning about six miles, I took another track, and rode about eight miles without seeing a creature. I then came to strange gorges, with wonderful upright rocks of all shapes and colors, and turning through a gate of rock, came upon what I knew must be Glen Eyrie, as wild and romantic a glen as imagination ever pictured. The track then passed down a valley close under some ghastly peaks, wild, cold, awe-inspiring scenery. After fording a creek several times, I came upon a decayed-looking cluster of houses, bearing the arrogant name of Colorado City, and two miles farther on, from the top of one of the foothill ridges, I saw the bleak-looking, scattered houses of the ambitious watering-place of Colorado Springs, the goal of my journey of a hundred fifty miles. I got off, put on a long skirt, and rode sidewise, though the settlement scarcely looked like a place where any deference to prejudices was necessary. A queer, embryo-looking place it is, out on the bare plains, yet it is rising and likely to rise, and has some big hotels much resorted to. It has a fine view of the mountains, especially of Pike's Peak, but the celebrated springs are at Manito, three miles off in really fine scenery. To me, no place could be more unattractive than Colorado Springs, for its utter treelessness. I found the Blanks living in a small room, which served for parlor, bedroom, and kitchen, and combined the comforts of all. It is inhabited also by two prairie dogs, a kitten and a deer-hound. It was truly homelike. Mrs. Blank walked with me to the boarding-house where I slept, and we sat some time in the parlor talking with the landlady. Opposite to me there was a door wide open into a bedroom, and on a bed opposite to the door a very sick-looking young man was half lying, half sitting, fully dressed, supported by another, and a very sick-looking young man, much resembling him, passed in and out occasionally, or leaned on the chimney-piece in an attitude of extreme dejection. Soon the door was half closed, and some one came to it, saying rapidly, "'Shields! Quick! A candle!' And then there were movings about in the room. All this time the seven or eight people in the room in which I was were talking, laughing, and playing backgammon, and none laughed louder than the landlady, who was sitting where she saw that mysterious door as plainly as I did. All this time, and during the movings in the room, 
I saw two large white feet sticking up at the end of the bed. I watched and watched, hoping those feet would move, but they did not, and somehow, to my thinking, they grew stiffer and whiter. And then my horrible suspicion deepened, and while we were sitting there, a human spirit untended and desolate had passed forth into the night. Then a man came out with a bundle of clothes, and then the sick young man, groaning and sobbing, and then a third, who said to me, with some feeling, that the man who had just died was the sick young man's only brother. And still the landlady laughed and talked, and afterwards said to me, "'It turns the house upside down when they just come here and die. We shall be half the night laying him out.' I could not sleep for the bitter cold and the sounds of the sobs and groans of the bereaved brother. The next day the landlady, in a fashionably made black dress, was bustling about, proud of the prospective arrival of a handsome coffin. I went into the parlour to get a needle, and the door of that room was open, and children were running in and out, and the landlady, who was sweeping there, called cheerily to me to come in for the needle, and there, to my horror, not even covered with a face-cloth, and with the sun blazing in through the unblinded window, lay that thing of terror, a corpse, on some chairs which were not even placed straight. It was buried in the afternoon, and from the looks of the brother, who continued to sob and moan, his end cannot be far off. The blanks say that many go to the springs in the last stage of consumption, thinking that the Colorado climate will cure them without money enough to pay for even the coarsest board. We talked most of that day, and I equipped myself with arctics and warm gloves for the mountain tour which has been planned for me, and I gave Bertie the Sabbath she was entitled to on Tuesday, for I found, on arriving at the Springs, that the day I crossed the Arkansas Divide was Sunday, though I did not know it. Several friends of Miss Kingsley called on me, she is much remembered and beloved. This is not an expensive tour. We cost about ten shillings a day, and the five days which I have spent en route from Denver have cost something less than the fare for the few hours' journey by the cars. There are no real difficulties. It is a splendid life for health and enjoyment. All my luggage being in a pack, and my conveyance being a horse, we can go anywhere where we can get food and shelter. End of Letter 10, Part 1